Welcome everybody. I'm Tammy Smith, the Parks Director for the Town of Speedway. We want to thank everyone for coming out on this brisk autumn day to celebrate with us. I want to take a moment um, to ask all of you to kind of reflect on your time here at Meadowood Park, um, the years you were here in the, and with the basketball history. And think about these trees and just, if everybody could just be quiet for just a moment and listen to the trees. Can you imagine what they'd be saying, remembering all of you guys who were here years ago and the history and the memories? It just, it gives me chills and I wasn't even a part of it, but I've learned so much over the past few months um, working on this project. Last November, I was contacted by Phil Hose about an idea that he and several other gentlemen had been discussing. They wanted to commemorate the rich history of Meadowood Park. Over the last 11 months, I have enjoyed the education of basketball and Speedway. Working with these gentlemen on coming up with an idea, presenting to the Parks Board for approvals, getting Parks Board's feedback on colors and styles, finding the right words for the marker, raising money, and ultimately leading us to this moment. I would like to introduce Mark Maxwell. Mark has been one of the local connections during this project. Thanks, Tammy. Hey, Thank you, Bill. Right, First time he's ever applauded me, I guarantee you that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's nice to look around and see a bunch of familiar and unfamiliar faces that maybe we've aged a little bit and just don't recognize each other. But this has been a great thrill for me. I'm glad you all came. I'm sure you're like me. You really wouldn't have stayed away because this is a special place to all of us. And all I want to do is spend a couple minutes to go through really how how we got here today. Um, as Tammy mentioned, this is really Phil's, Phil's brainchild, but it actually started more innocently than that because Mike Graves, a fellow spark plug, and he were talking on the, on the internet one day and Phil asked him something, I don't know what. And, Phil's, and Mike said he hadn't done it because he was at the Meadowood Park dedication. And Phil said, well, what are you talking about? And, and Gravy said he was just kidding, but that sparked the idea in Phil's brain that, hey, we ought to do something like this because this is a special place. And that's kind of how we got kind of how we got going. And to show you how special it is, Mike, where did you come from to be here today? Uh, Grand Prairie, Texas. So, and I don't, I don't know if anybody's come from farther away or not. Barbara, yeah, Barbara, where are you from, Barb? Minnesota, she didn't even play here. <laughs> and there, oh, see? Wow. Oh, that's right, I forgot about you, Chris. I'm yeah. sorry. How could I forget you? But I mean, so we've got people from all over, and it just shows how special this place was to us. And the fact that we're here today, I think, is awesome. Very quickly, after that idea popped into Phil's head, he got a hold of Tom Smith where we are. Ah, there's Tom, <laughs> our fellow classmate of 65. Um, and the three of us decided that this was a good idea to go forward. So we got a hold of Denny Pelly, another Speedway uh, classmate, not a classmate, but at Speedway at the same time, who's on the park board. And he, in turn, introduced us to Tammy, the park director, who's really been our guardian angel in this whole thing. I mean, she's she's actually the key to this more than any of us. We kind of had an idea, and she's really implemented it. And we put together, as she said, the wording and found a found a a, a distributor for the plaque through Tim Hose, Phil's brother, who was masterful in finding these people and helped us decide what what to do, which I think you guys are going to love it when it's unveiled, and how much the cost is. Once we found out the cost, we started getting hold of people however we could, and we raised over $3,000 in about a month. It, to me, it's unbelievable, but again, it just shows how much people love this place. And, and of course, it's, to me, it's just thrilling to be back here again. Um, I want to very briefly talk about the plaque itself. Uh, we were trying to decide exactly what to put on it, and we, of course, came up with some words that actually were Phil's words that kind of describing the area. But we wanted to put some names of some players on there so that people in the future would see who had played here and kind of make a connection with them. We needed people from Speedway, obviously, and so we chose three, three Speedway athletes. Two of them were Indiana All-Stars. One is Tom Gilbert, here to my left, class of 70. 
who played who played at Purdue and uh, is like most everybody here is really a good guy. Another is Bill O'Neill, who played for Speedway in 62, was an all-star, played at Notre Dame. He has since passed away, but members of his family, waving over there is Marianne, his younger sister, Joe. His younger brother is here, and they're representing, of course, the family and, and Bill. And then the third person we chose was Tom Jones, who I don't believe is here today. He was not an all-star, but he was County Athlete of the Year in 1960 and really started off a golden era of athletics at Speedway. We had four County Athletes of the Year in that decade. He was the first. He played three sports at Butler, and uh, he really kind of started that tradition at Speedway, which happened to mirror when Meadowood started and came to its glory back in the, in the 60s also. So we felt it was appropriate to have him. Then in addition, we wanted some names that, that people might recognize when they walked here 20, 25 years ago. And we picked the Price Brothers from Tech. I don't know how many of you played with them, but if you were here, you had to, because they lived here. Mike and Jim, both were all stars. Mike was drafted by the Knicks and also played for the Pacers. Jim was drafted by the Lakers, played for the Lakers and for the Bucks, and was uh, all pro in 1975 with the Bucks. Obviously both really good players and, and they were here all the time. They're featured in Phil's book, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, in addition, the other two choices were really simple. George McGinnis, who everybody knows, Mr. Basketball in 69, led Washington to an undefeated season in 69 was all Big Ten at IU and uh, was six-time All-Pro in the ABA and the NBA. is clearly a, a Hoosier legend. And then our friend, and most of us can say that because we played ball with him so much, but Bill Keller from, from Washington High School, who, and again, just shows what people wanted to do to be here, but Bill just had knee replacement surgery, and so he kind of hobbled up here, but he didn't want to miss it and it uh, shows how much he, like the rest of us, thought of the friendships we made here, meeting people that we never would have met. I guarantee you, we never would have met if we hadn't played ball with them. It just, it just would not have happened. And uh, Bill, of course, was Mr. Basketball in 65, led Washington State Championship in 65, played at Purdue, was named the best college basketball player in America under six foot tall, went on to play for the Pacers, was one of the most popular Pacers ever, and in my opinion, was the best shooter ever in the history of the ABA. But anyhow, he, some people might argue with that. I gave him that note. Too. <laughs> you know, Bill doesn't talk to me much, but he had this one note. So <laughs> in any event, any event, I'm going to turn it over to Phil to talk about his book. But before I do that, there's one other person I want to at least mention. But Morris Pollard was a coach at Speedway for 27 years. He was here about as much as everybody else because he had to watch his, his kids play ball. And uh, I know that he would think this is a special moment too. If Meadowood would mean as much to him as everybody else. So I at least wanted to mention him. And now I want to turn it over to Phil, who is an accomplished author. He's written 13 books about a variety of topics, but one of which was Indiana basketball, and he has a chapter in it about Meadowood. So Phil? Thank you, Mark. By the way, Phil and I not only are longtime friends, and of course my mom, my mom wasn't real fond of Phil because she thought he was going to get me in trouble, and he admitted he tried, but it didn't work very well. <laughs> and then in addition, though, we were classmates in the class of 65, and we were roommates at IU our That's sophomore true. year. So there you go, Thank you. Wow. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, this is a, a, big, a big day. Um, I lived on uh, school would drive, you know, a nine iron if I could shoot, uh, shoot it that far. And uh, this place was, um, I, I spent millions of hours here playing, playing basketball. The, the place had a life of its own. Uh, we even made our own rules that really didn't have all that much to do with the rules of basketball. We had uh, games were played to 24 points. You had to win by four and a basket counted for two. Uh, not one. Um, we, uh, when we had a rebound, you had to fling it back across the free throw line and, and then start forward again. That's not the way it is in most of the United States. It's, uh, uh, it's one point for a basket and uh, you can just do uh, straight up is what they call it. You know, where you shoot the ball and if there's a rebound, you can just keep tipping it up and then uh, 
whoever gets that point, it's called make it, take it, you uh, keep the ball, you continue uh, to keep the ball as long as you can uh, to reward that. We weren't like that at all. Uh, we, uh, as I said, played two shots and uh, we flung it back. And uh, so anyway, we, we developed our own style. The, the uh, disputes in which there were many, you know, were settled by shooting it. That's the Indiana way of doing it. You, you would shoot for it, and the reason that you shot for it was because, as it was always said, the ball never lies, and the ball never did. Um, I moved from Indiana uh, to New York City in, in 1971, but I'd come back for class reunions, and one time I came back, uh, and I came out here as I always did, and it was gone. I mean, just gone. It, the, the court had been removed. There was, there was nothing but... Uh, you know, a, a volleyball court, and it, it was shocking. I, I remember, I, I felt it, you know, uh, and talked to people about it and so forth, and I, I talked to several of my classmates, uh, as Mark has said, you know, uh, Tom Smith and and Mark and, and several others, and we were just talking in, uh, about how sacred this place was to us. It was really a, a big part of, of at least my growing up, and there's, there's two, and the more we, we talked about it, the more determined we became that this place was not going to die, at least in our hearts and memories, that, that we were going to uh, mark this place as, and say what it meant. Uh, so we, we started trying to organize a few other people, but the big break that we got was with Tammy Smith of the, the Parks and Recreation Department. She uh, agreed she uh, and supported us it would without her and without the support of the parks and recreation department we would have been dead in the water but um, we we launched and uh, the idea was to have a commemorative um, um, marker plaque to uh, say what it had meant what had gone on here and and what it had meant uh, to to so many people. I don't think there's an outdoor court in, in Indiana that is marked uh, like this. I remember for a book I wrote, I interviewed Oscar Robertson, and he was still really uh, upset when you'd bring it up to him that th there was no marker for the Lockfield Gardens uh, courts and uh, tournament uh, for them. And so this may be uh, the, the first uh, and only one. Uh, you know, Much is, I, I'm just going to read this, much has been made rightly of the great players who played here, but it meant just as much to we mortals who just wanted to sharpen our game or have fun with our friends or meet people we might not have come to know without a place like the Meadowood Courts. And I wanted to, um, I interviewed for my book, Hoosiers, uh, a few people, and I just wanted to say something from that. From Jim Price, who, as Mark mentioned, made his bones in the Los Angeles Laker backcourt with Jerry West, quote, On a Sunday, my brothers and I wanted to play the whole day without getting beat. Only a couple of times did anyone stay in the whole day. I always liked to guard the person who had the big name. It got my adrenaline howling. I hated for someone to score on me. It was brutal out there. You could knock heads all day with someone, then leave the court together and go have a Dairy Queen. From George McGinnis, I had been used to playing in areas where, Jesus, if it got hot, that was it. Meadowood, though, it had a nice drinking fountain. The cement was nice and smooth. There were no cracks. The buckets were true, just the right height. But what I remember most was the competition. We had some hellacious games out there. Bill Keller, when it got dark, it really got dark with all those trees. There was one light near the parking lot, and you could kind of see the light coming through when, through the trees. You could just hear your voices and the balls bouncing and the nets fluttering when you hit it. And then Craig Hoagie, who is young. I don't, is Craig here? I don't think so. He didn't come. Well, he's a lot younger than, than our group, but still meant a lot to him. Meadowood was truly a unique blessing that we were all lucky to experience. Not to dramatize, but it had a lot to do with forming me into the person I am today. I developed confidence. I learned to compete and to appreciate people that came from a different background from myself. There was never a high school or college game I played in 
that I was ever intim intimidated because I had seen and played with really good players previous to that. And, uh, and it's, it's true. I mean, this place was a, a lot of different kinds of places. It was a, a showcase place. It, it really got its name when the Van Arsdales started playing here uh, er, in the early 1960s. The word came around the neighborhood, Tom and Dick Van Arsdale are is playing here. And within seconds, it seemed like this place was surrounded by the people who lived here. And they played, they brought some of the uh, best African-American players from the city. They played here too. And there was a, about a two week period when every night there were these great games involving the Van Arsdales. And then they left and never came back. They have fond memories of, of the place. But it, the competition remained, and it was uh, one of the best places in Indianapolis to play. So I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here to commemorate this event. I'm glad that we pulled off the fundraising and, and uh, did it. And so before we unveil it, uh, I've asked Bill, Bill Keller to say just a few words about uh, what it meant to him. Bill, as has, has been pointed out, was uh, one of the most successful and one of the greatest players uh, ever in Indiana. And here you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil, so much for that uh, introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not moving quite as quickly as I used to. Um, I just had the knee surgery, as Mark had mentioned, uh, just two, two weeks and four days ago. But I was really honored that Phil called and asked me to, to be a part of today. Just having the opportunity to come out and see some of the guys that used to play here, uh, not only from Speedway, but from other areas uh, throughout Indianapolis. There are a few people here. Tom Smith is up here. Tom, will you come shake my hand? <laughs> Tom was the greatest storyteller alive at my basketball camps back in the, back in the day. He could keep he could keep those, those little kids interested in basketball with all the basketball jokes and stories that, that he had accumulated over the years that he played. And I don't think I've had a chance to see Tom in, in years, so it's, it's great to yeah, see you, Tom. See you Absolutely. Yeah. And the other guy here on my left, uh, Tom Gilbert, I hadn't seen Tom for many, many years. Um, probably since the old Purdue days. Uh, I've heard his name, of course, but not having the opportunity to see him uh, until today, it's great to see Tom as well. Appreciate it, appreciate it very much. There's another fellow that his, his name has not been mentioned. Uh, I think he's here, uh, Scotty Neat. Where's Scott? Hey, Scott, come on up and shake my hand, will you, Scott? I would, I would come to you, I'd meet you halfway, but Scotty was really a competitor enjoyed playing the game, loved, loved to get out here and play and, and knock heads with everybody. Good shooter, great competitor, and not only that, but he was a good person. So, Scott, good to see you. Appreciate it. Uh, you've met Mark Maxwell, uh, probably one of the greatest players to ever play at Meadowood Park. He told me to say that. So we traded lines uh, that I was the best shooter in Indiana, so we traded lines. So he was one of the best to ever play here. Uh, Phil Hose. I didn't realize how big a liar he was. <laughs> Phil Hose and I have been friends for years. It's really funny that when you, when you don't see someone for, for years and years and years, it's almost like today the guys that we've mentioned, you haven't seen them for years, but once you come face to face, and like with Phil, seeing him today, it was almost like we were back in 1960s, 62, 63, 64, 65. It's like we'd never really been apart because we were that, that good of friends and having the opportunity to spend time together. So being able to see Phil for, for just a few minutes here today was really exciting for me. And also I want to say thanks to Phil for putting this, this thing together with Tammy. Tammy, thank you also for all the work that you've done putting this together. And Phil, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm not sure who else is behind me that I should say hello to. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I'm, I'm in trouble now. Billy said that I was a storyteller, and I have a story to uh, tell you about Billy. See what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> I was a senior in college. He was a senior at Purdue that had just gotten beaten in the final game of the NCAA tournament. And he and Jim Roach, another classmate of ours, class of 65, he and Jim came over to visit me at Miami of Ohio. And we got up on a Saturday morning. They said, let's go play some basketball. So we went over to the gym. I tell this story to tell you how humble this guy is. 
and there were three guys down at the other end shooting, and they were all about six five or six six. Roach is about six feet tall, and Billy and myself said, do you want to play? And they said, yeah, we want to play. And what teams? And they said, well, the three of us will take the three of you guys. So here's Jim Roach at six foot, Billy at 5'11 or whatever, and me, and we're going to play three guys that are 6'5 six, or 6'6. Six, six. Well, Roach and I were smart enough. We just gave him the ball all the time. <laughs> and he scored. I think probably every one of our – we've been in three straight games. And when we got done – these three guys said, God, you're pretty good. You ought to think about playing college basketball. <laughs> and just got done playing the final game of the NCAA tournament. So. Humble Billy. Oh, that's, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Pre appreciate that. There's some other guys, too, that I thought might be here. Uh, Mike Alma. Where's Mike? Where's Mike? There's Michael. Good to see you, Mike. Uh, he, he never saw a bank shot he didn't like. Um, Steve Woolsey. I guess he had some things going on today. He's another one that uh, Mike was kind of the mid-range bank shot, and what well, Steve was probably the 25 to 30 foot bank shooter, and I think he could probably shoot those bank shots with his eyes closed. That was a neat thing about him. I'd say if he missed one, I'd say well, you need to close your eyes. You got your eyes open. No wonder you missed that that particular shot. Well, you know, being here today brings back memories. You know, when I, when I had basketball camps, I used to tell kids, what you're doing today are developing memories for tomorrow and down the road. And that's really what we're all experiencing today, is what we, what we were doing here many, many years ago were developing memories for today. And what a, what a thrill it is to think about having these great memories and these great friends and all the people that we've had the opportunity to become acquainted with throughout the years. Uh, so it's, it's, really, it's really an honor to be here. There were times when uh, I would come out to the park, and I started when I was a seventh grader coming here. My dad would just drop me off and say, hey, I'll come back and I'll pick you up in a couple of hours. Sometimes he would stay and he would watch. But I had the opportunity as a seventh grader to come out and experience Meadowood Park with with the guys that we've mentioned plus some of the older guys that uh, I want to say Sonny Sanders right. Sonny Sanders was one and I had the opportunity as a seventh grader to play against a lot of guys that were already in high school whether they be freshmen or all the way up to seniors it gave me an opportunity to really have to to really play as hard as I could possibly play to even compete and when I had a, the opportunity as a seventh grader to be selected on on a team of of guys that were high school players that was really quite an honor for me so Meadowood really when I think about it this was my start this is where it all happened for me was Meadowood Park I I, I think what we would do a lot of times is we would come here and we would bond you know, Saturday mornings we would call each other and say, I'd call Phil or he'd call me or Mark Maxwell or whoever, whoever it was. We'd call each other and we would come out and we would, we would meet here on Saturday morning and play ball all day and really have fun all day. Winning didn't really make a difference. Winning and losing was not the reason we were here. We were here to enjoy and, and to bond with one another. And we might even play even into the dark. There were a lot of times when we would play into the dark hours and then maybe decide some of the guys that could drive, we'd go over here to the Mug and Bun. I'm not sure, was it Mug and Bun back then? Yeah. Mug and Bun, and I think it still is. They have great tenderloins there, as I recall. But their root beer was fantastic. So we'd get a root beer, we'd come back, and we'd sit on the court, we'd drink our root beer, and just talk, talk basketball. We'd talk about a lot of different things. So it was really fun. It was a bonding time for friends. And uh, I made a lot of friends from, from Speedway, and of course, I went to Washington High School, and that was, uh, that was so much fun. Um, developing skills. Uh, I believe that this is one of the places where it really helped me to develop my skills. There were so many times that I would come here, and I don't know how this happened, but I'd be the only, the only player in the park. And I would play one-on-one. -on -one. Now, you're probably thinking, how did you play one-on-one -on -one when you're the only kid in the park? Well, I had an imaginary friend, and I played one-on-one -on -one with an imaginary friend going back and forth, dribbling against that imaginary defense, pull up and shoot the shot, go rebound it if I'd miss it, put it back in. And then the fun part of playing one-on-one -on -one with your imaginary friend is that you always have a chance to play on the offensive end. You never really had to play defense. And then when I'd get tired, what I would do is I would go and I'd go to the free throw line, 
and I would pretend that I was in the state finals. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I did that at Meadowwood Park, thinking, okay, I've got, I've got a one and one, we're down by one, I've got two free throws, can I win the state tournament? Well, several years later, after all, of the, all this time, I found myself in 1965, my senior year, we were in the state tournament. The first time I stepped to the free throw line during the final game of the state tournament, guess what I thought about? <laughs> I thought about Meadowwood Park. I thought about Meadowwood Park because I, have, I thought to myself, I have been at the line forever <laughs> shooting this shot. And I, I think it went in, I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> But that, that is a memory that will stay with me for the rest of my life. I used to bring my wife when we were out, because I grew up not far from here. Um, actually, I was just on the wrong side of the tracks to, to, to be a Washington Continental rather than a Speedway spark plug. One block. One, one block, wasn't it? One yeah. block. One block. Um, it was a railroad track. But uh, I can't remember exactly where I was going with that. Yeah, bringing Joyce here. Um, there, were, there were times that I wanted to show, because I, I lived so close, we'd, we'd visit my parents, and Joyce and I would come over, and I would park right over here, and I would watch the players that were playing, and just kind of reminiscing as, as if I have been there. I've been there before. I know what they're feeling. I know what they're, what they're doing. And we'd just sit there, and of course, she had no idea what was going on. She just thought it was a bunch of trees in a park and an asphalt court with, a, with four baskets. She had no idea. But the things that were going through my head at that time were thinking about all of my friends, all of the people that, that showed up to play, all the competition, the fierce competition that was, that was displayed here uh, at Meadowwood Park. And finally, after we'd be here for a while, she'd say, okay, have you seen enough? And I'd say, well, okay, yeah, well, I, I guess I've seen enough. And, and what I would do is I would drive the car, I'd back the car out, and I would go the longest way around so I could see the park from, from all angles. And what great memories uh, I have of this place. And I wanted her to share in those memories with me, uh, e even though if you, if you weren't here and you didn't live it, you really can't quite understand what it means to so many people. So today is quite an honor for me. I want to thank uh, Mark Monteith over here with the Pacers. Does the Pacer uh, website, if you will, uh, Mark? <clears throat> Mark got me here um, uh, a little late, um, but uh, <laughs> traffic was terrible. What it? We, we got here about one minute ahead of time. I knew they'd wait for you. Well, I, I was hopeful that they that they would. So so anyway, this is quite an honor. Is there someone here that I did not mention that played? Here. The that played here. Did, a lot of them. Did it well. <laughs> The, the, people, the, people, the people that are here, that played here, could we start over on this side and just step forward and say your name? You don't have to say anything. Just say your name and maybe the school that you came from. You want to start? It Watt, Speedway, Spark Plug. Speedway, Spark Plug. John Tucker, Speedway, Spark Plug. Jeff Neiman, Speedway, Spark Plug. Derek Miller, North West High School. Joe O'Neill, Speedway. Mary Ann O'Neill, Speedway, Spark Plug. Next. Scott Neat, Speedway. Speedway. Sam Hall, Speedway. Pat Kendrick, Speedway. Tom Kendrick, Cecina. What, Cecina? <laughs> <laughs> I just look. I just, oh, that right? I just look over there. <laughs> Anybody else on this side? Mike Alma. Mike Alma, Speedway. Larry Thomas, Speedway. Okay. Ron Fisher set a pick for Keller. <laughs> Was that a community? <laughs> Vince Noble at Speedway. Gary Rake, Speedway. Jim Butterworth, Speedway. Coach Butterworth, Speedway. Coach, good, good. Let's give yourself a nice round of applause. You know, when I, when I stand up here today, really what I'm doing is I'm not speaking necessarily for myself. I'm speaking for everybody that's here. Because this is, this is us. This is not just me. This is us. The memories that we have, we are going to cherish for the rest of our life. And we all have the same memory. 
we all have the same memory. We did it together. We had fun together, and we, 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 sometimes we got hurt together, but we banged heads, we were, we were competitive, and we loved it. So I am so honored to have the opportunity to be here today and, and just visit with you and pass along a few of the thoughts that I have, even though I got a little bit windy. I, I apologize for that. So anyway, does anyone have any, any questions? Am, are we taking questions? Do you want any more stories from Tom? <laughs> no. <laughs> I do have, I do have a, a story about Phil Hose. He's here. He's here. Yeah, he's here. Um, he may be here. <laughs> Phil, as he mentioned, just lived on the other side, not far from here. And I was visiting at his house, and we were going to go someplace, and he got, we got into the car, and he was backing it out of the driveway. You remember this story, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> you notice he said yes, but not very loud. So I said to Phil, there's a car on the opposite side of the street. He was backing up, and there's a car here on the street. And I said to Phil, Phil, you're not going to make it. Phil, you're not going to make it. And he bangs into that car. He says, thanks a lot. I said, Phil, I said you weren't going to make it. He said, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> anyway, do you want to, Phil, you want to tell them what your dad did? You remember I, what your I, dad I did? Want to, I want to amend the story. No. <laughs> <laughs> what, he, what he said was, you got it. You got it. You got it, which I took to mean <laughs> you've safely passed through the space. But no. <laughs> <laughs> well. His dad, remember your dad came out of the house and waved at the guy that got out, that came out on the porch across the guy that owned the, owned the car? Yes. And he I, said, I'll take care of it. it had had happened, you done that before? It had happened so many times <laughs> that he didn't want to waste time. <laughs> anyway, this has really been an honor for me, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to be here today. I love it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> well, has the big moment arrived? Where is Tammy? Right here. Okay. <laughs> okay, first of all, I want to thank the following donors whose generosity helped make this dream a reality. Uh, Jay Dunn, Mark Maxwell, the Smith family, T. Dunn, Pollard family, Nelson Martin, Tim Hose, Charles Jordan, Michael Graves, Jean and Larry Thomas, Chris Biltmeyer, Nazareth Building Services, Andrew Gilbert, Scott and Jan Neat, Philip Hose, Alma, Greg Smith, Crandall, Tom Smith, Tom Jones and Bill O'Neill, Janet Erfer, Denny Pelly and Tom Gilbert, Michael Pollard, Scott Larson, E. Lou Jones, Craig Hoagie, Donald Kutch, Jim Hutchins, Randall Graves, Jeannie Carver in honor of Steve Woolsey, Joanne, Tim, William, David, and Jeff Neiman. And hopefully I remembered everybody. If I missed somebody, I apologize. We have worked on this project for the last 11 months, and we are so happy you all are here to share in this exciting unveiling of the Meadowood basketball marker. Afterwards, there will be a reception at Dawson's for those over 21. And with that, we will do the unveiling. What a picture. Now, can we get a picture of all of you looking at us?